Biological information, overlapping genetic codes. Today, we're going to dig behind one of the assertions that was made in one of the chapters uh, with references, and we'll look at some of those references as well. We've been looking at uh, the book, Biological Information, New Perspectives, which uh, has a number of editors. Um, published by World Scientific Publishing. It should have been Springer, but uh, they uh, walked off on it. Um, this proceedings of a symposium held in May 31 through June 3, 2011 at Cornell University. And the book is actually available online. I went ahead and bought it anyway because I felt like supporting the publishing company that, uh, that printed it. And it's a pretty expensive book, one at a pop. You're, you're donating, there's no question. Um, <clears throat> the book comes in uh, a general introduction and then four sections, information theory and biology, which is where the chapter we're looking at came from, biological information and genetic theory, which is actually another chapter that mentions a little bit about this. Uh, theoretical my Molecular Biology, which may as well, I don't know, I haven't read all of these in detail, uh, and Biological Information and Self-Organizational Complexity Theory. Um, there, uh, one of the papers we're looking at is multiple overlapping genetic codes profoundly reduce the probability of beneficial mutation. And the thesis was made, and I think made fairly well, that if we have such things, there will be a problem. The question was raised, do we actually have such things? And that's what we're going to be discussing. Two, two questions. How extensive is it? If it's just once or twice, it's no big deal. Um, actually, that's, a, that's an excellent question. And we hope to answer some of that as well. Um, obviously, we won't answer all of it because we don't completely understand the genome yet. And so. Uh, there may be more than what we know, or some of what we know may be, in fact, uh, incorrect extrapolation. But this is the best information I can pull out of the literature um, in a reasonable time. The chapter, Not Junk After All, has a lot of comments about codes, and, but does have a little bit about overlapping codes as well. Um, there, as were raised, there are two questions. One of them is are these overlapping codes for the protein coding stuff itself. That is to say that you have the same code and, in, and each codon is being used in two different ways or three different ways or a maximum of six different ways. And, you know, do we see that? How much do we see? And uh, that's... Um, let me give you an illustration of that. If you take a, this is not a random uh, sequence, but it's, uh, it's one you might run into somewhere. Um, you can separate that uh, into triplets in this way. And if you do that, you will get a particular amino acid sequence. Now, if you take off the first G and leave the last GT off as well, now you have a sequence that is 1 over. And you will notice that with a long bunch of A's, you're going to get lysine and lysine in the middle anyway. But now instead of tyrosine, you have threonine. Instead of aspartic acid, you have isoleucine. Instead of asparagine, you have threonine completely changes the, con the, uh, the protein, except where you have long uh, repeats. Um, and you can also separate the GA in the final T and get a third reading frame going forward. And now you're going to get lysine and lysine in the middle again because you have all those A's. But now you're going to get leucine, glutamine, proline, and arginine. Well, there's a proline, but, you know, 
you can see that there's considerable difference between those three sequences. Well, it's worse than that because if you look at uh, that sequence and if you take the reverse uh, sequence, the one that matches it, um, because the, of the way things are constructed, the five prime and three prime areas are switched. So for a T, you'll get an A. For two Gs, you'll get two Cs. For an A, you get a T. For two Cs, you get two Gs. I'm, I'm sorry, for three Cs, you get three Gs. And then for eight A's, you're going to get eight T's, and so forth. If you're wondering about why these don't match, it's because in this font, they're not exactly the same. But that's the way it would read in the five prime direction. And now you can separate that according to the same three triplets that you had before and get a new sequence. You'll notice that phenylalanine occurs twice here. Uh, but some things that are totally different from what we've seen before. Well, I mean, with the occasional match, there was an isoleucine on the other side. Um, <clears throat> or you can separate it, again, with the first one being out and the, th the next two being out, moving that frame over. And now you get a, 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 uh, another, again, with the long <coughs> phenylalanine, they're going to they're gonna appear in the middle, but you can see that now we have proline instead of threonine or tryptophan, depending on how you want to match it, and um, valine instead of, uh, pardon me, glycine instead of valine and tryptophan, um, leucine versus valine, and this is actually a stop codon. That would tell the protein to stop. So that's, at least in this short sequence, that is not an open reading frame. It stops right here. You must have something up before it, and this would be a good place to terminate the, pro uh, the protein. And that's one of the things that happens is that um, stop codons appear periodically in some of these alternative reading frames. And when they do, you no longer have an open reading frame. You can't produce a protein out of it. Um, and finally, of course, you can separate the first two and the last one out and get triplets that way. And if you do, you have, again, phenylalanine and phenylalanine because of all the T's. But now we have cysteine and asparagine and leucine and glycine. Well, I guess there's a glycine here. But you can see on, on the average, the proteins are entirely or nearly entirely different. And that's how you can get six different proteins out of one coat. Now, the problem, of course, is do all these proteins work? And the answer is no, most of the time. So intuitively, unless somebody's really deliberately looking at a precise sequence, you're not going to get six codes realistically most of the time. But you could get two codes if they overlap just a little bit. And in fact, we will see that. Well, we talked about overlapping uh, codes for the protein itself. There are also overlaps between protein coding and non-protein coding functions. For example, short MRAs, uh, a short um, a non-coding RNA will bind with the regular coding RNA sometimes and decrease its uh, use, uh, decrease its uh, output. And if that happens, it's most useful to have it transcribed from the opposite strand because then it matches perfectly, and you don't even have to try to match it. It it matches naturally. But there are a few other <coughs> protein uh, codons that have to be there. Promoters. Or uh, th these are parts of the DNA that are necessary to get the protein uh, trans or the uh, RNA transcription process started. 
And those, those promoters require very specific sequences. Yes? Yeah, d just a clarification here. When you have overlapping codes, you're talking they are functional? I mean, you showed us examples, but uh, are, are they The functional? ones I showed you are not necessarily functional. Well, but this one would be. Right? We're going we're gonna to get into how many of them are there and how functional they are in just a little bit. This is, I'm just discussing right now the principle behind it, how you can get six different sequences from one set of RNA, or one set of DNA. All right, so maybe you'll address it. But this idea if there's overlapping and there's, you need a promoter to start the sequence, right? You need a start and a stop code for each protein. Right. So if they're overlapping, then how do the promoters keep each uh, protein sequence separate from each other? So address that at some point. Well, that, that's, that's an interesting question. Actually, you need, you need the promoter. Then you need the start codon, which for bacteria in particular is methionine, which only has one codon. And then you have to have the rest of it being an open frame after that until you get to the stop codon, which closes the frame off. So the promoter starts the, the sequencing, and right. then, but you still need a st start codon, right, to, so right. it knows where to start actually That's transcription. Right. That's right. You need a promoter plus a start codon. So the, the start codon could be thought of as part of the protein. The stop codon comes immediately at the end of the protein. Those can kind of be thought of all together, but beyond that you have to have, I guess actually I should have it beyond it this way because most people read left to right. Um, beyond that, you have to have a, a promoter region, uh, and there are, there are actually two different varieties of that, one of which starts the transcribing machinery, and the other one of which may bind a protein which says, start the transcribing machinery here. Um, and this is really important because the idea is that with that binding agent there, now you start to transcribe more of the protein than you would ordinarily. Um, this is the kind of thing where if, uh, if an E. coli, for example, senses that there is lactose in its vicinity that it could digest, most of the time it doesn't get lactose. So most of the time it doesn't bother to try to digest it. But if there happens to be lactose out there, then it will, then, it, then a, a lactose detecting uh, scheme will say there's lactose there and it will bind uh, a galactosidase promoting region to the, uh, to what I think they call it a TATA box because it has T-A-T-A-A -A -A or something like that uh, to begin. And then it has a start codon. So there's actually, three, there's actually three regions involved in starting it, one of which encourages it to form, well, one start. of which is required to start, period, and the third one of which is required to say, and here's where you start. Yeah. Okay. So you've got, you've got actually three different, uh, uh, three different regions that are required extra, one of which can be thought of as part of the protein, but the other two of which are actually not. So, and, and they have to be in an appropriate space, so you have to have filler DNA in between them. Okay, so those, uh, those promoters of either kind, of the kind that encourages, binds to protein and encourages the transcription, or the kind that allows the transcribing stuff to bind, period. Both of those require specific sequences. Now, there are, you know, the filler in between there can be virtually anything. The centromeres kind of require general sequences. As we saw last week, there are quite a few variations that can be put in there and still work. But 
in general, there's a kind of an overall structure you need. And it works best with a specific sequence. And then there are length extenders, which only require that bad code be avoided. That is to say, if you have to have a loop of DNA, you have to have enough DNA for the one part of the loop to get to the other part and, and for it to bend appropriately. But those loop, those length extenders have very few requirements. I won't say none. You wouldn't want some of them to <coughs> code for the production of hydrogen cyanide in people, for example, because if it did, the pe person would not survive. Um, but, you know, other than, you know, some kind of toxic thing that, that shouldn't be in that at band, you can put virtually anything you want to. Um, and so those ones are kind of, if I see a length extender and you put something in it, well, it's technically two codes, but it's like one and a twentieth or code or something like that. It, the, the, the overlap is not very big. There are some very interesting things that have been found. One of them is that if you have a code, uh, an intron, which is normally just a bunch of DNA that's clipped out, um, allowing for alternative splicing, but, uh, but also allowing for, uh, you know, basically you're, you're uh, putting the protein back, to, uh, or you're putting the RNA back into the standard code that it should be in. Uh, sometimes those introns will have codes for a protein themselves. It's two codes in one, but it's again, it's like one uh, quarter codes in one. Oh, so you're saying it could be both an intron and an exon? Yeah, it's both an intron and it's an exon for another proton, protein. Some of the people may not know basically what an intron and exon uh, is. Uh, can you just say just a little bit? Uh, well, the original definitions. Uh, the original definition was an exon was something that actually coded for protein one triplet at a time for one uh, amino acid at a time. That's an ex intron. It's the one that actually codes for protein. The intron w is stuff that's there in the DNA, but it doesn't code for anything, and what happens is that it gets snipped out. Now, it turns out that in order to do that, you have to have the one end of the intron signaling, here's where the intron starts, and the other end signaling, here's where the intron ends, so that the spliceosome can go and cut right at that point and allow the protein to be read all the way across. Much more complicated than you'd usually think of. But um, uh, one, of the th one of the things that I, I ran across was that, uh, that alternative splicing allows you to code for, um, in, in the cricket ear, which is in its leg, there are these little tiny hairs that respond to certain vibrational frequencies. And there's about a little over 300 of them, if I remember correctly, each one responding to a little tiny bit different frequency. And the way they do that is that they have proteins where you can take a exon, you know, A and C and F and, and, and uh, so on, and make one protein that's this stiff, and then with a little tweak, you can, you can make A and E and F, and so forth, um, and make a protein that's a little stiffer, and, and then you do an E and D and F, and then so forth, and then the next time you'll do A and E and G, and, and, uh, and so with all those combinations, you can make 300 different kinds of proteins, one for each cell that senses its own particular uh, frequency, sound frequency. So these, 
these introns turn out to be really important and, and for the cell to be able to say this is my set of exons that go together enables the cricket to hear different pitches whereas otherwise all it would be able to hear is sound. So uh, those, those are codes for protein and they have to be very specific but there are also those introns that have to be very specific at the beginning and at the end. In the middle you can pretty, pretty well put what you want to although it may have a slight influence and maybe if you put the wrong things in the wrong intron uh, the protein the cricket would only have 250 instead of 300 of those um, uh, different kinds of hairs. Um, there's a very interesting PhD thesis um, uh, by Niv Stabath uh, his major professor happens to be Dan Grauer, whom we'll hear about more next week. Um, uh, University of Houston, and um, you can find the thesis there. And it happens to be on overlapping genetic codes. So he basically went through all the literature at the time, 2009, which is only five years ago, not too bad. and. Uh, it actually explain, explains the frameship codes well. So if you want a little more information on that, you can go to the website and uh, it's free. You can read it yourself, although uh, be prepared for heavy slogging. Uh, and one of the graphs that was interesting is the number of overlapping genes versus number of genes in bacteria. Now the blue dots are ones that they're pretty sure of. The red dots are ones that they're estimating from uh, certain features, but they're not quite as sure of. And it was fascinating to me because here is 2,000 genes, and there's 400 genes, which means that that dot there is about 20% of the genes overlapping. Whoa. This dot is about 10%, maybe 8, 9. This dot here, in fact all of these that are in a line here, is about 40%. So apparently there is extensive overlap between bacterial genes, uh, and these are, these are the actual genes, and in a little bit we're going to see that some of these will be the actual exons that are overlapping. Here's the uh, HIV virus. And there's where I got that from. Uh, and you can see that the five prime long terminal repeat at the beginning doesn't overlap with anything. Uh, but then when you get to the gag, this is an actual protein that the thing makes. And the pole, there's a considerable overlap between them, not, not anywhere near 100%, but you know, what would you say, 20, 15 percent, something like that? You get over here, you'll notice that pole overlaps with VIF, and VIF overlaps with VPR, and VPR overlaps with TAT, which <coughs> in completely includes REV, and REV has a big tail, which also includes the tail end of TAT, and then the, there's a break between them and VPU, and then VPU overlaps with ENV, which overlaps with the tail end of TAG, and REV, and uh, then there's another break here, and then there's the long terminal repeat on the three prime end, which happens to code for the last part of the NEF uh, protein. Now that's HIV-1, and you'll notice that HIV-2 is somewhat similar. Uh, <coughs> there's a little bit of difference in the exact proteins that are being coded for here. This is VPR here, and now this is VPR here. And uh, TAT and REV still overlap with each other and still overlap with uh, N. But now NEF has a slight overlap. <coughs> These things are compactly made so that it looks like the, protein, uh, uh, the proteins are, are, have some overlap. And it's interesting because there is an actual frame shift 
This is going back to the PhD thesis. And you can see this is uh, gag and this is pull. And you can see how there's a, there's a frame shift where it's reading the same DNA in two different reading frames. Now obviously these reading frames are much more constrained. You can't just replace a C for um, a G. I mean, you know, ordinarily, CC will code for protein, proline, it doesn't matter what. Um, so you could change this one arbitrarily, but if you do that, then the leucine up here will be something else. And if it happens to be something that is, uh, will not allow the protein to work, then, if, then, uh, then you can't just change that to whatever you like. That's actually the beginning, so it establishes the family. And that's why these things are much more tightly constrained than a standard code, because a standard code, most of the time, every third, um, every third code doesn't really matter. That is to say, if you do CC, you're going to get proline whether it's CCA, CCC, CCG, or CCT. And that's true for most of the amino acids, not all of them. Methionine only gets one code. Tryptophan only gets <coughs> one code. Uh, somewhere in there, there's the stop codons, and they kind of I interfere with others. And there's a few of which, a few of the codes where the, where the C and the U, or it's actually T in, in DNA, a code for the same protein for the third code, but the G and the A now code for something else. So you can't just throw um, a nucleotides out there and hope to get what you want. But um, in these kind of situations, the third one is pretty well spoken for already because otherwise it puts it in a, in a different protein, and in some cases, in an entirely different class. Um, one of the papers that was cited is overlapping codes within protein coding sequences in genome research. And it's actually available on the web. And um, let me just read a part of it. Genomes encode, encode multiple signals, raising the question of how these different codes are organized along the linear genome sequence. Within protein coding regions, the redundancy of the genetic code, that's the, the one where if you get CC, you're going to get protein, proline regardless of what your third one is. That's redundancy. You don't really need the third code. You just need anything in there. Um, the redundancy of the genetic code can, in principle, allow for the over overlapping encoding of signals in addition to the amino acid sequence. But it is not known to what extent genomes exploit this potential, and if so, for what purpose. Here we systematically explore whether protein coding regions accommodate overlapping codes by comparing the number of occurrences of each possible short sequence within the protein coding regions of over 700 species from viruses to plants to the same number in randomizations that preserve amino acid sequence and codon bias. Codon bias means that some animals prefer, or some organisms prefer, um, like 70% GC. They're either C or G 70% of the time. Some of them prefer AT. Some of them prefer a more or less random amount. And by the way, for, uh, for um, animals or, or for organisms that live in very hot environments, they generally tend to like the GC stuff better because it binds to itself more tightly and it's harder to destroy using heat. We find the co that coding regions across all phyla encode additional information with bacteria carrying more information than eukaryotes. 
The detailed signals consist of both known and potentially novel codes, including position-dependent secondary RNA structure, bacteria-specific depletion of transcription and translation initiation signals, and eukaryote-specific enrichment of microRNA target sites. What's an e e eukaryote? Eukaryotes are organisms that actually have a nucleus. In bacteria, for example, and in archaea, they're simpler. They, the, the DNA is just floating around in the cytoplasm itself. Uh, in other words, the whole organism is its own nucleus, so to speak. Whereas in eukaryotes, and that's things like uh, plants, fungi, uh, paramecium, amoeba, you know, various one-celled organisms, and animals up to and including people, um, the cell has its regular membrane around the rest of the cell, and then it has a separate place for the nucleus. Mm -hmm. And the nucleus contains virtually all of the DNA. There's a little tiny bit in... Uh, uh, mitochondria, and there's a little tiny bit in uh, chloroplasts, which are also enclosed in those particular organisms. But in general, most of the DNA that forms the organism is found inside of the nucleus. And that, that is eukaryotes. Prokaryotes are the first cells, supposedly, because they don't have that kind of organization to their, uh, uh, their DNA. It just is in the cell. Uh, and so you carry out specific enrichment of microRNA target sites. This is RNA that's uh, microRNA that's being produced by animals or plants that have a nucleus rather than by bacteria or archaea are really kind of very much like bacteria in many ways. Uh, there are certain other ways in which they're not and probably to go into the precise difference between those two is beyond the scope of this talk but I would say that uh, uh, that for the purposes of nucleus organization, archaea and bacteria are the same. Is that okay? Um, our results suggest that genomes may have evolved to encode extensive overlapping information within protein coding regions. Interesting. Well, genomes may have evolved to encode extensive overlapping information within protein coding regions. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can translate that. We know that these things exist, so they had to have come from somewhere. And the only uh, way that we can think of how they came is having evolved. So our results must suggest the genomes may have evolved to, in, to do what we see already. He's making a case for overlapping genes which decrease the possibility that it evolved. Yes, yes. It makes it more difficult to evolve. But you see, if you only have one game in town, then that's what you've got to do. So this gets into, of course, survival of the fittest. Uh, how are you going to get survival of the fittest for two different programs if they're different? Well, the, the real question is not survival of the fittest. That's actually pretty obvious. And the real question is, how did the fittest arrive there in the first place? I mean, this is extremely complex uh, uh, calculations here. I mean, this gets really hairy. You know, I'm, what, I, what I also find interesting is our results suggest that genomes may have evolved. That's, if you have no other sources for this, I, I would think you'd, you'd say our results indicate that genomes have evolved to encode. But I guess they don't want to say it quite that strongly. 
uh, raises an interesting question. Do they have some question in their own mind as to whether, whether uh, these things didn't actually evolve? Well, I think he's just, he just making the case for overlap and not really thinking about how it got there to begin with. Well, that would be my read on it. Yeah, you, know, uh, you may I, be I right. You, you may be right. Okay, uh, I did a little digging of my own and I came up with this, which is an interesting article. Mapping C. elegans non-coding transcriptome with a whole genome tiling microarray. Ooh, let me see if I can translate that one. C. elegans is planaria. It's a little flatworm. It has only about a thousand cells in it or something like that. Um, and the non-coding transcriptome is the DNA that is transcribed into RNA or the RNA that's transcribed from it, if you prefer, but that doesn't actually code for protein itself, but does other things. Or maybe it doesn't do other things. Maybe it's just accidental and it's, and it's junk. It's not only junk DNA, but it's junk RNA that comes from it. And we'll see that argued next week. Um, I tend to look for a function before I just say it's junk. But um, that's a uh, design-centered uh, hypothesis rather than an evolutionary hypothesis which expects junk, as we'll find out next week again. Um, and whole genome tiling microarray is a very specific way of finding out whether you've got RNA that's produced. And, and what they do is they attach 25 base units to some kind of a uh, substrate. And then they allow the RNA to go across it. And if it happens to match those 25 strand, uh, RNA strand, uh, bases, then it sticks to it and won't get washed off further. And if you then detect it, you can say, well, this must start with this. And then if you can even take f it from there, and if you finally do peel it off by uh, perhaps heating it enough or perhaps uh, using the right solvents, um, then what happens is that you can take that RNA that you have selected out and magnify it multiple times using what's known as PCR, uh, basically using it to create more copies of, DNA, of RNA. And you can produce a million copies out of one copy of uh, RNA. It's very sensitive. Um, and then you can sequence those million copies with a machine. Uh, or if it's not enough, actually, you can take w some of those and then magnify them again until you've got enough to where you have a whole bunch of RNA that has exactly the same uh, size. And then you can send that through a sequencer, which will uh, measure what's, what, what's the next base, and then what's the next base, and what's the next base. And basically will sequence these things. And it used to be horribly expensive, and it's now getting down to where um, you, know, you can do tests on people for like $15. Not doing the whole uh, human genome, of course, but uh, doing substantial parts of it. Um, <coughs> and again, this is on the internet. So you can look at it yourself. Um, and I'll just read a little part of the article. The NPA sample produced 97,548 transfrags, all of which could potentially represent non-coding transcripts, except transcription uh, coding for histones. Apparently histones need RNA, among other things, to, to work. Uh, nearly 70% of the NPA transcripts overlap with annotated exons or introns of coding genes. So this is not genes overlapping each other now. This is transcripts that are being used for whatever 
and some of which we don't know, uh, but which overlap coding sequences. Whereas 20.8% are non-annotated intergenic uh, TUFs. So 70% almost of the transcript overlap with exons or introns, and most of them with ex uh, exons. A uh, qu question here, uh, Paul. Um, when you have an overlap, how long a sequence do you have to have to say it's an overlap? Well, if I, if I look at what they have uh, and some of the graphs, I would interpret it. I, I, I wish I had somebody here who's more knowledgeable about this stuff, but as, as I look at it, it looks like in some cases they're overlapping like 30, 40% or more. And in a few cases, maybe the, the entire exon. So apparently some of these things are fairly extensive overlaps. Now, the thing of it is, do they have to be exactly that stuff? Well, that we don't know. Uh, and that's because we don't understand the code itself. We can't really say how much of it could be changed and still work. So uh, these, I tend, to, I tend to think, are a little softer than things that actually code for protein, because once you code for protein, it's pretty hard uh, to change that. Um, another article, Kapernov, P. et al., 2005, Ep uh, examples of complex architecture of the human transcriptome again, that's the part of the DNA that's transcribed, revealed by race, and race has nothing to do with what color your skin is or anything. It has, that's, uh, um, it's actually an acronym. Uh, CDNA ends is the last part of it, and I'm temporarily blocking on what the first two letters mean. Um, and high density tiling arrays. So again, they're doing these, they're doing these uh, little blocks that, that uh, select out RNA, and usually in specific areas as well, which is why they're tiling. Um, and again, that one's on the internet. Let me just um, look at that again. Yeah, that's again genome research. Genome research is almost all on the internet. So, you know, it's just a matter of learning the, learning the language, learning the principles behind it, and then you can read it all you want. Recently, we described the sites of transcription at a five base pair re resolution for 10 human chromosomes, 30% of the non-repeat portion of the human genome. As part of this study, a total of 768 randomly selected and annotated regions of transcription were studied by a combination of race and high density arrays to validate the presence of transcription occurring at the selected sites and to better understand the structures of the unannotated transcripts. A total of 634 of the 768 loci, that's over 80 percent, yielded a set of five prime and or three prime race products and 61 percent of surveyed loci showed evidence of overlapping transcription on the positive and negative stands, strands of the genome. So apparently, at least for this particular function, overlapping is the rule rather than the exception. Now again, is this tightly constrained? And my sense is it's probably not that you change five or six bases, it probably doesn't make that much difference as long as you don't pick some of the critical ones. Um, obviously, somewhere along the line, it makes a difference. Now, I have dots behind it, yes. The reason why is because, and I, I don't know why, uh, I was gonna show you the rest of the, uh, the rest of the abstract and it's, it, it doesn't have anything to do with these overlapping transcripts, but, and I'll probably run into it in a little bit here, but um, 
And then there's Bernie et al., which is a paper in Nature, which is done by ENCODE before their big announcement in 2013. Um, was it 2012, whichever one it was, that they were putting out stuff well before then. And this is identification and analysis of functional elements in 1% of the human genome by the ENCODE pilot project. And it's in Nature. And for what it's worth, Nature has recently decided, and I don't know how long they're going to keep this up, but if you want to read something in Nature, you can't download it, you can't print it, you can't send it to anybody else, but you can look at it on the Internet. I suppose you could do screenshots of it. Uh, I haven't tried that yet. Take a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, you certainly could take a camera picture of it if you had a detailed enough camera. So for what it's worth, this is your chance to read nature. And this one is found, again, on the internet. Um, we report the generation and analysis of functional data from multiple diverse experiments performed in a targeted 1% of the human genome as part of the pilot phase of the ENCODE project. So what they were doing is they were getting ready to do the entire human genome. And so what they did is they said, well, let's start with 1% of it and see whether this is feasible or not. These data have been further integrated and augmented by a number of evolutionary and computational analyses. Together, our results advance the collective knowledge about human genome function in several major areas. First, our studies provide convincing evidence that the genome is pervasively transcribed such that the majority of its bases can be found in primary transcripts, including non-protein coding transcripts and those that extensively overlap one another. And there's, you, you notice that there's uh, transcripts that overlap one another. These, again, these are not protein coding mm -hmm. as far as I know. And, oh, this is the one where I, this is the one where I uh, quit uh, and, and you can see there's a bunch of other stuff here, but doesn't have directly to do with overlapping transcripts. So educate me on, so the ENCODE project was to determine the function, how much function there was in the whole genome, uh, and, they, and found that there Pretty was much. What they did was they discovered that a lot of things that were not protein coded were actually being transcribed, and they're, they're going, what's with this? And so the first thing you want to do is quantify them. How much of this is being made? In what kind of cells? Um, does it have it any... It could still be transcribed and not used. So. Yeah, it could be transcribed and not used. Um, maybe it's used in something. And so we're, we're, they were trying to figure out uh, what was going on, and they started to get some hints that, in fact, some of it was probably being used. Yeah, or would they not uh, say, well, this is just a transfer of, of genes here, of gene, gene units here, per se, and uh, you explain the evolution by saying, hey, we, we just copied this from this one. Uh, well, that, I mean, I'm sure that people would do that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to show you some. I thought there was some counter that, that some people aren't accepting the, the, those findings of the encode. Well, uh, that's actually our subject for next week. I'm sorry, I couldn't do both of them in one week. That'd be too. That'd be too dense. Um, as a matter of fact, as it is, we're uh, uh, we've got about ten minutes to go uh, in the official time. So, uh, of course, we've taking a little more time during, the, during it to discuss. Well, here's a couple of interesting tables that I found in that, in that PhD thesis. One of them is fascinating. Look at the number of genes in overlap. 13.4% in humans, 10.3% in chimpanzees, 13.6% in mouse, 4.9% in rat, chicken. There's overlap all over. The, more interesting thing is, except for C. elegans, which has only 0.4%, you actually have uh, the, the overlaps are mostly in the exon, well, not mostly, but um, I guess in the case of Fugu, it is mostly. But um, 
in, you know, there a substantial minority of these are actually exon exon overlaps of the kind that we saw with gag and pole. So apparently this is not an isolated phenomenon of two or three genes. There's 600 of them in people. There's an even more interesting, uh, um, I bet you you didn't know that we are more closely related to mice than rats are to mice. So the next time you hear that, um, uh, that joke, are you a man or a mouse, squeak up, uh, know that, in fact, there is some reason for that confusion. Um, 274 overlaps between man and mice. 146 of them are exon exon. Remember, there are only 600 in humans to begin with, right? 600 and whatever it was from the last table was 634. So this says that, what, about a quarter, a fifth of them maybe, something like that, are actually the same in mice as they are in people, but not the same as rats. Go figure. <laughs> now, the claim was made in chapter 6, you may remember, and this is why we're doing this, that there are multiple overlapping codes and that this made it hard to evolve those stretches of DNA. Well, I think the first part of the, cl of the claim seems to be substantiated. There are multiple overlapping codes and they're all throughout and some of them are of the difficult to evolve variety. There is not massive overlap. It's not like most of the code is overlap, but it does happen with fair regularity. Yeah. The second part is of course disputed. It makes it hard to evolve those stretches of DNA. You may remember that uh, there was that claim that uh, we now know that DNA, c that evolution can do this. But the, the claim that evolution did this seems to rely on the assumption that evolution happened. And if you're, what you're trying to do is test that assumption, then the existence of multiple codes seems, at least in my mind, to argue against an evolutionary cause for these multiple codes for the same DNA. Certainly against an unguided evolutionary cause. Remember the paper that we were discussing at the beginning, multiple overlapping genetic codes profoundly reduce the probability of beneficial mutation. Well, I think they do that. Uh, and apparently there is a substantial part of the genome where multiple codes happen, including in our own genome. But again, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. It sort of depends where these overlaps are, too. If it's in, like, promoter regions, areas that turn things on and turn things off, that's going to have a huge multiplier effect. It wouldn't, you wouldn't have to have the whole code be overlapping. It's just in certain critical parts that would have a... Changing one little part would have a profound detriment. So well, apparently you can have a protein that has inside of it amino acids that are a certain way and then you can have the uh, promoter code for another protein that will do the same thing. So, uh, y you know, the way these things are juggled, um, I think Bill Gates had it right that the uh, DNA code is like computer code but far more sophisticated than anything we've come up with yet. Yeah, I just, I just go. 
doesn't take much imagination to think how just one of these changes would, would be lethal. Uh, you, yeah. You're, you're going to destroy all. Try to improve one system, you're going to destroy the other one. Well, that, that's, that's, the, that's the number one problem. How do you evolve upwards from there? Well, I guess maybe that's why humans and mice are stuck in their rut. Yeah, well, there are other sociological factors related to that. <laughs> Uh, the other, the other question is, how do you get that way by one? How do you get there in the first place by one step after another step, each step of which is advantageous? Dr. Geem, so how do they even discover that these things are, are overlapping? How do they know that this protein is, is actually overlapped with this other protein just because of the? I mean, how do they de determine that? Well, the, the first thing you do, uh, un unless you're dealing with proteins that the, that the body makes huge numbers of, like collagen, you can reverse engineer collagen into what kind of DNA would it take, and you can actually look for that DNA. And uh, you know, every, th every third one doesn't help you very much, but all the other ones do. Um, I think there's a case of leucine where there are actually six codes that code for it. Um, if you've got tryptophan, you know exactly which one that is. But what you do is, is if, you don't, if you don't know what you're looking for, because there's two proteins, uh, both of which are made in minuscule amounts in the cell and are hard to isolate, and maybe you're not, uh, you know, maybe you don't even know that they exist yet, what you can do is you can go through the the DNA and look for what they call open reading frames. And those are frames where you keep going and going and going and you don't hit a stop code. And then if you take those and then you look for upstream, I guess for you guys it's upstream, uh, so the protein is coding and then it hits, finally hits a stop code after 300 uh, or whatever, you know. Then you go upstream and you look for a start code, which should be methionine. And then you go upstream of that a certain ways and you look for the Tata box. And then maybe you'll go upstream and look for maybe promoters of some kind or other. So if you see that kind of stuff, even though you don't know what the protein does, you say there's then probably you know there's a protein there. A protein there, okay. And then what you can do is you can run it through the machine and see what kind of a protein you get out of it. Maybe even allow it to fold and make antibodies to it, and then send those antibodies into the cell. And lo and behold, they stick to a particular gate. And you go, oh, that must be the gate protein. So then you purify the gate protein and you and you say. Uh, and then you sequence the gate protein, which can be done just like you sequence DNA. And uh, you say, you know what? That matches. That must be the DNA that codes for this protein. OK. In the, uh and then if you have two open reading frames that go to the same place, then that's, that's where you say, well, these two have to overlap at this point. OK. In the graph you showed of the uh, two HIV uh, virus ones yeah. where they had the overlaps. They had those, the ones near the, they were on that side of the graph where they had a little piece here and then it went up and then it, I guess, connected to another piece over here. So how would you even manage to discover that it's really only taking skip portions and then putting this new sequence out of these little chunks? <laughs> well. In, in our, uh, pardon me, in uh, HIV, the, there are enough of the viruses that you can actually purify, you know, uh, the viruses and then purify specific proteins from them and then sequence those proteins. And apparently there's some little short things that, that, uh, that require certain amino acids and then, uh, or certain DNA to make the amino acids that form them and then certain other DNA that make the other amino acids. And obviously, this is an exon-intron thing. 
in a virus, which really doesn't make sense. <laughs> but apparently it happens. <laughs> so this, stuff, this is definitely blowing my mind how all this stuff fit together. And it seems uh, just completely impossible that that could involve. You know, I, I hope that the two things come out of this. One is a little bit more of an understanding of what's going on. And the other one, I think, is a certain amount of awe at, at how, how complicated this whole thing is. It, the little, you know, the idea that you have a gene for tall and short and and uh, you know you dial it up a little bit and you get a little taller and you dial it down a little bit and you get a little sh you know no that's way too simple yeah now in those sections that they were talking about where it was the the non or the, the transcribing but the non protein coding what amount of of overlap i mean i guess could that be overlapped but with I guess I, I don't understand what the function would be or not be of that s portion. Well, there are two answers, one of which is I don't know either. <laughs> okay. And, and in some cases, I suspect that, the, that the, <laughs> the researchers don't know either. Okay. Uh, okay. Secondly, I can say that some of them appear to influence how coding RNA is transcribed. You get a little piece and it gloms onto it and it apparently slows it down. You get other pieces and they imitate it and it slows down the breakup of that particular RNA so it makes it last longer. Um, which ones do what is a matter for experimentation and I'm not sure all those experiments have been done. Uh, some, enough have been done to where we know that those functions could exist. But, you know, how far into it, I don't know. And in some cases, I think they don't know either. And that's what science is all about, is finding out the unknown. So the, the chances that the, the last part out of the, uh, the PhD thesis where it showed, you know, I guess human had 11 or 12 percent overlap, that could grow. As it could. Grow. It could. I don't think it'll grow that much because they are really interested in open reading frames and and um, so they've they've kind of spent extra time on them but uh, but I, I it could grow some the thing of it is now we have an actual sequence of you know three billion genes uh, three billion bases so we can actually go back and look at which ones have what and in some cases we can look at them oh that's a centromere because it has this and it happens to be just about in the right place for the chromosome where they usually stick together. So you get, you get that whole uh, uh, you know you get the complex and it's in the right place you say that's got to be it. Uh, but interestingly enough, there are actually some proteins that are coded for in the middle of centromeres as well. <laughs> Just to make it more fun. Okay. This makes evolution all the more unbelievable. Well, you, you know, for those of us who allow that as a possibility, it certainly does increase its chances of being true, right? If you believe in it before you learned it, then, then you can... No, uh, you know, if just all you have is it has to have come from evolution, then all you can say is evolution must have done wonderful things. <laughs> because what else can you say? If you, you know, if you go, well, maybe there's a designer. Well, you know then you look at this stuff and you say, it's got to be designed. There's no way that happened just from random mutations. Anyway, come back next week and we'll discuss people who shoot, try to shoot down the idea that the genome is mostly functional. <laughs>